All right, so we've got a problem here. We're going to work it. Sound good? Yeah, so I, I like giving you guys kind of different stuff so that you get to see a number of different things. Uh, that should help you out whenever it comes time to work different kinds of things on things like exams. So hopefully that is uh, an experience that you get ready for. All right, so what we have here, we have two gears that are meshing with each other. We have a 30-tooth gear and a 50-tooth gear. On the 50-tooth gear, we have a 12-inch diameter uh, you know, drum kind of thing, the spool that this rope is, uh, could be wound up on. And then we have over on the 30-tooth gear an 18-inch diameter spool. Okay. Um, we also, because if that's all we had, then what would happen is the uh, weight that's pulling down on those ropes would actually start to unwind uh, off of those spools. And so we have this link that goes from point B to point C up there, and that link prevents the gears from turning. And we have enough information here on the board to figure out uh, what the force is that has to be held in that link uh, BC in order to keep this gear train from moving. Sound like fun? Yes, it sounds like fun. Sounds like so much fun. So where should we start? Okay, free body diagram. I agree with that. What should we draw a free body diagram of? Okay. Okay, what I actually think is that it's often helpful to look at where you have the most information and try to start there. All right, that's going to make your smoothest uh, path through the solution if, is if we start where there is the most information. So where do you feel like we have a lot of information, like a problem we could quickly solve? Okay, so there at the weight, the 318 pound uh, weight that is pulling down at E, it wouldn't be that hard for us to figure out uh, how much force we've got in rope DE and rope AE, right? So let's start there. How do we do that? Okay, the other good thing about this is that it forces you to go back and remember a topic that we covered earlier, right? Go back and make sure we're not forgetting how to do concurrent force systems. So we do a drawing of the body. Let's say that's the 318 pound force uh, or pound weight that's hanging on there. Okay, what sorts of forces act on that body? Weight, okay, you can do that one pretty easily. That is what value? 318 pounds, all right? Good, we got started. Then what? Okay, we have one force that goes up kind of this way, and we have another force that goes up this way. Do we know the values of those two forces? We can find them. We don't know them yet, but we can find them. Let's name them. Let's say that this is F, D, E, and let's say this is F, A, E. Okay, what else do I know about this system? Okay, I know the directionality of these forces in the form of some angles. So I know that this is 40 degrees, and I know this over here is 65 degrees. Okay, then what? What do I do with this free body diagram? Okay, we sum force components. Okay, I'll start with the X. Which forces have X components? Okay, FAE and FDE. So let's look at FAE first. So there we have minus FAE, and we only want the horizontal component. How do I get just the horizontal component? Okay, I multiply by the cosine of 65 degrees. And then FDE, okay, cosine of 40 degrees. 
All right, then what? Okay, there aren't any other ones, so we set this equal to zero. And that has two unknowns in it, right? Okay, so we can't actually solve that just yet. So we'll go down to the next one. Sum of forces in the y direction, where upward is positive, and we'll have FAE. I don't want the entire FAE, I want just the vertical component, so I need to multiply by the sine of 65 degrees. Okay, the next component is the FDE component. Does it point upward or downward? So that one is also positive. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay, and then I have to put in there the force that I have uh, from the weight. So I subtract 318 pounds. Sure, so what I have now is a system of equations. The question was, can we plug it into the calculator and solve it? And the answer is, why sure we can. I recommend it. So here's a calculator. This is the Casio calculator. Um, if you go to mode and you go to five, it goes to equation mode. We're gonna do a two by two. And we put in the coefficients of our variables first. So here I've got negative uh, cosine of 65 degrees. Next, I've got cosine of 40 degrees. And I'd like for you guys to either learn how to whisper or to not talk so much in class. Appreciate that. That, that would help a whole bunch. All right. Next, we've got what? Okay, next we've got the sine of 65 degrees. Then what? Okay, we got the sine of 40 degrees, positive, right? And then what? Okay, we got 318 is negative in this equation, but the way it's looking for this value to be entered into the calculator, it, it wants it to be as if it's on the other side of the equation, which would actually take that negative sign and turn it positive, right? So I don't put a negative 318, I put in a positive 318. And so my conclusions are that FAE must be 252.19 or 252.2, we'll say. FAE is equal to 252. 0.2 pounds, and what is FDE? Okay, 139.1, I'll call it good there, 139.1 pounds. Okay? So why are those helpful? Okay. Yeah, that's the tension that's going to be in those two ropes that go up and now wind around the, uh, the two drums, both at A and at D. Okay. So how do I use those? What's my next thing to do? More free body diagrams, right? Yeah. Okay. Like of what? Okay, we could do the two gears, the two gear assemblies that have a gear and a drum on them. So let's go ahead and put a, the 30 tooth right here with its drum right here. All right, and then it's got its pivot point right here in the middle. What happens there? I'll just go ahead and put those on first. Okay. Vertical reaction and horizontal reaction. Okay, maybe I'll call that R. Uh, I'm going to move that location of that a little bit. I'm going to call that R uh, A Y, and this I'll call R A X. Okay, what else? Okay. 
So I have this force that's coming from uh, the rope that pulls down right there. That's something that I know, correct? I know the value of that force now that I did the first part of the problem. Okay. What's the value of that force? Okay, 252.2 pounds. All right. Good so far. What else? Okay, I, I can put on the angle of that force if I want to. How do I know the angle? Okay, that's given, if it's 65 degrees, uh, that's given in originally, you know, in the original statement of the problem, that is also a 65 degrees that I could put right here. Okay, so I can put that on there. What else? Okay, there's a point at B, right up here. And what happens at B? Okay, there will be both horizontal and vertical components of force. Do I know anything more about it than that? Okay, you do know the distance between B and A. You do know that much, so we, we could put that on there. As a matter of fact, I'll go ahead and do that. How far is it? 15 inches, so I'll go ahead and put that like over here. What I was getting at with my question of do you know anything more than that, look very carefully at the member that is actually creating the force at B. Have we looked at a member that was in that category before in here? We actually, did, did we maybe give it a name? Like maybe did we call it a link? Okay, it's got a pin on each end. It's got a pin at B, it's got a pin at C. How does it behave? Because that's the only two places it's connected, is at B and at C. There aren't any other outside forces acting on it. Okay. Did that tell us anything about the direction of force that that member must carry? I know it's been a few days. Okay. It means that the line of action of the force carried in that member extends along a line from one to the other. So I do know more information than just that there is a vertical and horizontal component. That's not that that's false, that's true, but I know more information about it than that. I know the line of action of the force that acts at that point. Okay? So I can go ahead, instead of showing two components of force at B, I can show just one component of force at B. That's helpful because it reduces the number of things I don't know. Right? What do you want to name that thing, that force that I just put there? Okay, I like FBC. Someone suggests FBC. Okay, what else? Do I know anything else? Okay, I do know the diameter of the drum. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, that's one thing I do know. Where do I actually care, though? I care about this radius right here. Let me go ahead and put that on directly and say if it's 18 inch diameter, this is a 9 inch radius right here. And that's probably what's going to matter to me more than the 18 inch diameter. Okay? There's one other thing that I don't have written, or there's actually a couple other things I don't have written on my free body diagram that I could. Okay? For one, it's good practice to always put your axes on. So I'll go ahead and stick those on there. That wasn't the one I was really going to say, though. What else? I said a second ago, we know the line of action of FBC. Okay, that means that we know the directionality of FBC, and we can state it in some way. How do you think we might want to state that? Okay, rise over run isn't actually that hard to do, given the information that we know at the very top we know that it's 48 inches across from B to C. Let me put 48 right here. What about the rise over that 48 inch run? Okay. Yeah, it'll be 36 inches minus 15 inches. Do you agree with that? So I'll just put that as 36 minus 15. Cool. So there's a free body diagram. 
Shall we do the other one while we're here? Yes, sir. What's your question? Just like a kind of concept, if F of BC is whatever force on the smaller drop, would that be the same force on the bigger drop on the opposite side? Ah, so I think his question is, because I've defined the force here acting on that pin at uh, B, his question is, is that going to be the same value of force that acts at pin C, right? And the answer is, yes, it will, okay? Um, because if you look at that link from B to C, it only has two places where forces act on it, right? And so where those two forces act on BC, they have to be along the same line, and it means that where they react on the things on their ends, it also has to have equal amounts of force. So that is a good observation there. Let's go ahead and draw that diagram. Okay, so there's our gear on the outside. Here's the drum on the inside with a pin. And what he just said was that over here where we have this pin, he said that this FBC should actually be equal in magnitude, opposite in direction to the FBC that I had on my other diagram. Okay, and because it's equal magnitude, opposite direction, that means we can specify uh, the slope that happens here. Okay, it has a rise of what? 36 minus 15. It has a run of 48. Okay, good so far. What other forces act on this body? Of course, we got reactions at the pin, right? Okay, so I'll put those on here. This one we'll call RDY, uh, and this one I'll call RDX. What else? Okay, I have a force coming from the rope DE, right? So we could put that on here like this. All right. Do I know anything else about that force? Okay. 131 point, what was it again? 39, sorry. 0.1 pounds. Okay. Anything else? Okay. I know the angle of that force, right? So I could put here that this is going to be 40 degrees. What else do I know? Do I know this radius right here? OK. That radius is 6 inches. What else should I put on my free body diagram? OK. Yeah, someone says I should probably have a distance up to this point right here. Okay, that's going to be 36 inches. Okay, and then this is a x-axis, this is the y-axis. Anything else? Yes, sir. Okay. So the question there is, is that 40 degrees acting on the correct side, or do I have it drawn on the correct side of the force? And the answer is, it looks to me like it is appropriate, because if I was to draw a line right here, 40 degrees would be equivalent to 40 degrees there, all right? Alternate interior angles and all. So the 65 and the left angle, or the left angle? So that's OK, there, there is. Make sure I'm uh, looking at this right. Yeah, the 65 degree angle would apply to the rope that's connected to the gear on the left. The 40 degree angle is associated with the rope that's connected with the gear on the right. Yes, sir. But like, see how 65 is still on the same side of the rope? So it's still going, supposed to be on the other side? Is it? Yeah, I mean, the, the point there is that, you know, it doesn't really matter. Like, I could draw a line right here, and this angle right here would also be 65. All right, 
No one has said anything yet. Both of these diagrams are missing something. Contact with what? The other, the other gear. Okay. So we, uh, we need that in there. This, this problem will not solve if we don't have that in there. Okay. It will, uh, this, this problem actually would go dynamic if that, was, uh, if that was not included as one of the things that we need in there. So how should we put it? Okay, let me do it this way. Um, let me show a torque. I don't actually know off the top of my head what direction the torque should be. Okay, you might be able to look at it and figure it out to some degree, but it actually doesn't matter. Okay, we need to put a torque on here and assume a direction. Okay, and what do you want to name it? How about TB? Okay, so if I have TB acting right there, what direction does the torque act on gear C? Okay, tricky. It looks like it's the other way, right? Kind of is if you're talking about forces interacting right there, but both are clockwise. Okay, so and this is correct. If this is TB, then this is the direction that TC uh, will act. Wow, we've got a bunch of free body diagram stuff up here now. What is it we're trying to do? You just want to survive, right? That's what you're telling me? Okay, you just want to survive. Okay. Ultimately, this is what you're trying to find. How much force is carried in that link BC? And then, you know, part of that is telling me, is it in tension or is it in compression? Okay. So what we need to do is try to find our most efficient path toward getting that. Right? That's the thing that we want to know. We don't necessarily need to know everything about this whole problem. We need the most efficient path toward finding the link, uh, the force in the link BC. Okay. So what should we do? Okay. You may have picked up on this by now. Moment equations are very powerful. Why is that? Doing a moment equation is powerful because by choosing a good point to do your moments around, you can eliminate some of the things that you don't know. Okay. And for this, it's a uh, it's not all that hard to see where a couple of good places might be to choose. So for instance, I could do for body uh, AB over here. Remember, this is A, this is B. So we'll say for this body that's over on the left, we can sum moments around point A. Um, Always is a big word. The question was, do you always sum moments around the point with the largest number of unknowns? I would say very often you do, uh, because what that does is it eliminates a lot of the things that you don't know out of your equation. It allows you to find at least one thing. And once you know one thing, it, it often leads to a problem where a lot of other things become easier to find once you know one thing. Okay? So that is true a lot of the time. It's not maybe always true. Okay, so summing moments around point A, what do we do? I have minus TB, okay, because that goes clockwise, right? That one's pretty easy. What else should I put on there? Plus, okay, FBC. Times what? Times, I just want the horizontal component of it. Okay. But that's not all I need to do, because that, that equation right there, that little expression gives me uh, just the horizontal component of FBC. 
but right now that's a force, right? And what do I need? Okay, I need a, a moment, which I need a force times a distance. So I multiply this by 15 inches. Okay. What else? Okay, yeah, I have the force in the rope. It's another thing that I have to deal with. So uh, what does that do? Two fifty two point two pounds times what? Do I need to do the cosine of sixty five? Yeah, I already have a length that is perpendicular to the line of action of that force. Okay? So there isn't a need in this case for me to try to pick off a just one component. Right? Because I already have a length that gives me the moment directly. It's just the radius. So this I multiply by 9 inches. Okay? Then what? Anything else? Okay? One thing I'll sh I should talk about before I go ahead and set this equal to zero we picked off the horizontal component of FBC, right? What about the vertical component? Okay. The vertical component of force FBC has a line of action that goes through the pin, right? What if it didn't? Like I could have been really mean to you in this problem and I could have put that pin right here. Right? Okay, but I was nicer to you, but I wanted to go ahead and redress what would happen if that pin wasn't lined up right there. Okay, and what the answer would be is that you'd add another component into this and figure out what moment was created by the vertical component as well and add that into the equation. And that's the only thing that's different. Okay, yes, sir? TB is not so much a force, but a torque. Okay, that is a torque that is transmitted from gear to gear, or it's TB is the torque that we have applied to, uh, to gear B over there, and TC is the, is the torque being applied to gear C, right? Yeah, so the, the point is actually a good one in that another way we could have done this problem is with uh, contact forces at the, at the gears. What would be the downside of trying to do it that way for this particular problem? Do I know the diameter of these gears? I do not. Okay. So that, that creates a complication to me trying to just put a contact force and dealing with it that way. If I do them as torques, what information can I bring to bear on this problem that's going to be useful? Go back up and look at the original picture. I know the teeth, right? So that means that I know the ratio between TB and TC because I know the teeth, numbers of teeth. Okay? So that's, you know, this is important for us to uh, kind of look at our problem and uh, try to set up the free body diagram in the most appropriate way possible for the information that is given. All right. So I actually am done. Someone said we could set this equal to zero, and I agree. So this is, this is for body AB. How many unknowns? I've got two unknowns. Great. And if I add in uh, an x equation, that adds in RAx. If I add in a y equation, that adds in RAy. So adding those two in, each adds another unknown, and I'm no better off than when I started. So let's actually hop across and do the other body over here. I'll say body uh, CD. Okay, and we'll do a sum of moments about what do you think? This was point C, this was point D. Okay. We'll do a sum of moments about point D. 
And what will we have? Minus TC. Okay. It looks like FBC would also create a clockwise tendency to rotate. So I'll say minus FBC, but not the entire FBC. The vertical component doesn't do anything, so I need just the horizontal component. So I multiply by that same thing I had before, 48 over the square root of 48 squared plus 36 minus 15 squared. times 36 inches, okay, what else, okay, plus FDE, okay, which let me go ahead and put in, we know what FDE is, correct, 139.1 pounds, times six inches. What is that six inches? The That's the radius of the spool around which that rope is wound. All right. Anything else that creates moments on this body? All right, let's take stock again. How many equations do we have? Two equations. How many unknowns? Okay, we have three right now, but there might be a, a slick thing that we can do that helps us out a little bit. Okay. I know over here, let me actually do kind of a little separate thing. Based on gear ratios, if I want to know the torque, let's say TC, what is it going to be? Okay, it'll be 50 over 30, those are the numbers of teeth, times... TB. Okay, so I can do a quick little substitution right here and say instead of TC, I'm going to turn that into 5 thirds TB. Now I have a two equation, two unknown system, right? So what do you think I should do? I should calculate, okay? So we're going to go to equation mode again. I'm going to put in my coefficients. Let me start with my top equation up here. My coefficient for TB, negative 1, right? Coefficient for FBC, okay? 48 times 15 divided by square root of 48 squared plus 36 minus 15 squared. That, did that take care of it all? Looks like I did. Okay. Then what? Okay, yeah. Those of you saying negative 252.2 pounds times 9 inches, that's right, because that needs to move to the other side of the equation. All right, so I say negative 252.9 times, or excuse me, 0 0.2 times 9. All right, then what? It looks like I can get that whole thing in there. So here, I want to put in negative 5 thirds TB, and the coefficient there is just negative 5 thirds, right? So negative 5 over 3, then what? Okay, here I've got negative 48 times 36 divided by the square root of 48 squared plus 36 minus 15 squared. Does that take care of that one? Okay, and then I have to put in my constant term there, 
which I will also, I'll negate that one because it needs to move to the other side of the equation again. So uh, minus 139.1 times 6. Okay? And the first variable that I was listing in these equations was TB, correct? So TB turns out to be 1,544.8. What are the units on that? Okay. Okay, what you can do is you can actually look at this equation and it should be the same as what this constant term turns out to be over here. It should be inch pounds, right? Okay, and that's TB. But that's not really what we wanted to know. What did we want to know? Okay. The force in rod BC is negative 52.76. Okay, what does that negative sign mean right there? It's the opposite direction than what we assumed, right? So in order to interpret that, we have to go back up here and look at what we assumed. We assumed that the rod tended to put a force that direction on the left gear and a force this direction on the right gear. Okay. If that's what it's doing, then the effect of the rod is to tend to hold those pieces apart. It's like they're pushing apart. Do you agree with that? Okay. Which means the rod's carrying what kind of force, would you say? If, if, it does, if it does what I assumed, it would be carrying compression, okay? Because by pushing it out, that means the gears are pushing it in, right? It's depending on the perspective of the parts that you're looking at. If you're pushing something apart, then those things that you're pushing apart are pushing you in, okay? So, but we came up with a negative value. What does that mean? means it's actually reversed from that, means it holds those points inward it, rather than pushing them outward. So what we go up here and say is that it holds 52.76 pounds of tension. bada bing. All right? If you'd seen that problem on a test, what would you have done? Okay. Now, if you see a problem like this on a test, what are you going to do? You might still skip it, but you, what you'll probably do after you skip it is get to the end of the test and not be afraid to go back. All right? So, yes. Say that one more time, I didn't hear you. F, um, the force in BC is a tension force. So if it was a flexible member, what it would tend to do is elongate due to the forces that are being carried on this thing. It would tend to elongate member BC. So we assumed that it was under compression, but it was actually We assumed, it by, by drawing these forces FBC on here in the direction that we did, we were assuming that member was in compression. The fact that we came up with a negative value means that was not right. It's actually holding a tension force. So if we had drawn it the right way, we would have then, then we would have come up with a positive number at the end if we had drawn it, drawn it the other way at the beginning. Yes? These equations right here? All right. You guys want to do some hands-on stuff now? Yeah. Sounds good. Let's get to it.